No, dear friends, I do not know if it has ever struck you or come to you with real force. What shall I render unto Jesus? 116 of Psalms 12, 13, and 14. What shall I render unto the Lord? for all his benefits toward me. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord, now in the presence of all his people. What shall I render unto the Lord? What shall I? You see, we can be unrealistic. Religious people are airy fairy people. Listen, my dear friends, always acknowledge and value moral superiority. When you see somebody who has got stronger character. Admit it. I found some of my companions at, you know, in those early days when just I used to pray with a few people. I used to be amazed at their character. I said, oh my. This friend of mine has a superior character to my own. That's it. Let's not meet it with cynicism. Oh, who is he? What is he? You know, the newspaper is full of cynicism. I see that some of these writers in the papers and commentators will tremble on the judgment day. They're filling the land with sewage and cynicism. So much as to say, Everything is relative. No, everything is not relative. Yes and no can never be relative. Black and white can never be relative. Sunshine and midnight can never be relative. Salted dish and a saltless dish can never be relative. You know, just wipe out morality. What are you doing? You are wiping out your own family. And some of these fellows who write so big and talk so much have no families worth talking about. They have destroyed their families long ago. And so they are out to wreck other families. Oh, my dear friends, example. You know what weight example carries. The royal family must know that history's page is recording the devastation caused by an example which should never have em emanated from the palace.
And how many are the people who are walking that path of self-destruction? Example. Nobody needs to tell you, my dear friend, that you need to be an example. You know, some one of the things that most people seem to resent today. I'm amazed. I'm just amazed. You know, when I captained a team, I knew that I had to inspire the team. I had to lead the team to victory. If I went in and made a double duck, you know, it wouldn't help at all. That's not a captain's innings. But so much resentment if told, hey, you're not being an example. Why should I be bothered about being an example to anybody? Oh, why should anybody have to censor me? My dear friends, your conscience censors you. What are you rendering unto God for all his benefit? You know, freedom, freedom, freedom. We are talking about spreading freedom and democracy. But do we value freedom? Freedom has become license. License to do it in the streets, as the song goes. And you write something more salacious, you will quickly get a knighthood. You may figure in the next birthday or some investiture. What sickening values? So, the streets of Britain today are awash with lawlessness. My dear friends, do you want it that way? So that a little child can't Go across the village green? Or a jogger? Go out for a morning jog? Is this the country that we wish to create? Alas, men shall be lovers of their own self. Why should I be an example? I will do my thing wherever I please. Be it the street or be it anywhere. Shocking. Shocking display of national immorality. And being proud of it. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Unthankful. Proud. Covetous. Unholy. Parental responsibility is Another thing that is given the go-by. You know, I can't do anything about it. Why? Is there no moral rudder in the family? 
Is there no word of God? Are there no Ten Commandments? You know, our little effort in Hyde Park Corner, Speaker's Corner, brings out some of the standards that have come to prevail. When I heard of the young teenager who laughed uncontrollably at the mention of fornication, oh, that's no sin. And these are the kind of people that are filling this world with the spread of AIDS. No, that's no sin. Of course, if you go by the writers and the commentators in our newspapers, that's what you would say. Alas, men shall be lovers of their own selves, unthankful, unholy, covetous. You know, friends, money is a servant. And today, when we see so much of the taxpayers' money in danger and jeopardy, and people are getting so heavily taxed, and the national wastage, you know, no, but you, are, you have killed the conscience. You have taken away, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not steal. You have filled the workplace with thieves. People who steal the time from the government. Workmen that give no more than six hours or five hours of work and go home with a paycheck, paying them handsomely for eight hours. I want to tell you, my dear friends, if you don't shine in the workplace, there's something wrong with you, something seriously wrong with you. Because here are our fellows just passing time while Britain sinks. And you are there working meticulously, conscientiously, honestly. You mean to say you would need somebody watching over you to discover that your work is superlative? No. Nobody needs to acknowledge it. Nobody needs to backpat you. But you are doing it whatsoever you do, do it as unto Christ. That is our law. We do it unto Christ. So the whole nation is benefited. The money of the taxpayer is conserved. Not stolen. Oh my beloved people. The Lord will help you to make a difference. Really speaking, 
instead of laughing at each other. You know, when you have clowns in places of authority, they will be there to entertain. Oh, I overheard a conversation between Mr. Bush and uh, Blair. Not a very nice conversation, and that has to be broadcast to everybody. Well, idlers, plain idlers, they are wasting public money sitting in the chamber. Oh, my dear friends, on the contrary, instead of laughing and, and turning it all into a big joke, I wish I could see our representatives standing up and weeping for the state of Britain. And pointing to the Savior who is able to retrieve this condition. Now, listen, you can choose to be a very small person. You can choose to be a very selfish person. You can choose to be a person who says, well, you know, that's far beyond me. Or you can choose to be a light. No man lighteth a candle and putteth it under a bushel, said Jesus, but on the candlestick, that it might give light to all those who are in the house. Put the light on the candlestick. Stand fearlessly by the truth. And whatever may be pitted against you will not stand. Last of all, let me take you to the 12th chapter of Mark. Twelfth chapter of Mark. Here the Lord is applauding a poor widow. My, my. And as the master sat there, I don't know what inspired the heart of this widow. Forty-first verse. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow and she threw in two mites which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples and said unto them, I say unto you, this poor widow has cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. What do you think inspired this poor widow? She did not have the cross before her like you and me do. She did not have that recognition, apparently, that the one who was watching was the maker of heaven and earth. She did it as unto God. She never knew 
that she was being noticed by the king of creation. My dear friends, that is all the notice that you and I need. That's all the notice. Let us not look to the gallery for applause. You know, there's a nature in us which says, I'm not being recognized. My talent is not being recognized. My dear friend, if you're really talented, and if you mingle it with humility, nobody can put you down. No one. Here, the Lord looks on this poor woman and says, Her gift is more valuable than everyone's, the rich people's, handsome gifts. Sometimes, when I see the poor, I find that it is the poor that have sacrificed. It is not the rich. This is exactly and literally true. It's the poor that have the sacrifice. It is amazing. It is an anomaly. It's a paradox. Strange. But that's it. And it is the Lord who must recognize the sincerity of our gift. See, what is not put into the hands of God without a broken spirit is totally valueless. You know, when you give something to God with a lofty spirit, God will not even look at it. Be it a million or be it a billion, God will not even look at it. But when it comes with a broken spirit, what shall I render unto God? With Calvary before me, with the love of the cross before me, I tell you, it may just be two pennies, two pence, but it's invaluable. It comes from a broken spirit. Let us pray. Loving Father, when we look at your marvelous word, Thou art the God of recovery. Thou art the God of redemption. Thou art the God of the resurrection. There is hope. And against the backdrop of Calvary, how humble we must be. Did, did God love a wretch like me? Oh, my gracious Father, give to us a broken spirit. Across the length and breadth of this nation, grant, we beseech you, instead of this supercilious, asinine mentality, grant, we beseech you, a broken spirit. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his mercies, his cross, his blood? The shame, the spittle, the stripes which he bore for me. What shall I render unto the Lord? O oh Lord, 
let not this matter just stagnate in aimless debate. But on the contrary, let our response be sure and resolute. Be truthful and worthy of the cross. Hear our cry. And imprint your truth upon our hearts. We ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen.